Hi lovely people, welcome back to my channel. My name is Leila. On this channel, I talk about life in Korea, what to do before and after you get in the country. Before I get into today's topic, I just wanted to briefly go ahead and introduce my new program called Roadmap to Korea. It is a three week program with weekly sessions with yours truly. And this program is perfect for young professionals or maybe not so young, interested in moving to Korea, coming here, learning the language and finding ways to stay in a country long term. So if that sounds like you and you are interested, then definitely work with me. I'm going to put a link to the website in the description of this video and also the link somewhere on the screen for you to see. All right, perfect. So let's get started on today's topic. In less than two weeks, I would actually be celebrating my 11th month here in Korea. And I wanted to take this opportunity to talk about like the purpose of me coming here in the first place, which was to be fluent in the language. So I want to talk about my Korean learning journey, the process, the things that I came to realize. And I don't want to make it seem like, okay, this is how it's going to be for you. Because at the end of the day, we all have like different backgrounds and different experiences, but I want to make it into a, what I thought my expectations versus my reality. And hopefully you can find that fun. And hopefully you can also, uh, you know, learn a few things and maybe uh, get some warnings or whatnot. And uh, hopefully that would be useful for you. All right, let's get started with number one. All right, so let's talk about expectation number one. I thought that six months would be enough for me to conduct any types of conversations in Korean. It is not. Whew. Now you might wonder, why did you think that, Leila? And to be honest with you, when I moved to America, I was put in the English language program of my university. After three months, they graduated me from the program and told me to go and take regular classes, said I was going to be fine. And that was true. After six, seven months, I was fine. But the thing is, at the time, I already had a very solid background in English. I had studied the language three to four hours every week for five to six years or so. So with the solid background, of course, it made sense that after six months, you know, when you are immersed in the country with people speaking the language around you, going to a classroom, you are bound to be successful at some point. With Korean, I had no such background. And that was my mistake, assuming that six months was going to be enough. With zero background, it's very hard to make that happen. Now, it wasn't zero. I mean, if you want to know what I did before coming to Korea, I, I knew how to speak. I mean, speak. I knew how to read, how to write. I had studied a grammar, so I had like all those very essential, um, I would say, elementary, elementary Korean down. I also had those expressions learned through Korean dramas, the intonation, all that kind of stuff going on for myself. And I scored at level two, which I was very proud of. But at the end of the day, I did not have a background. I never studied the language at school. So why was I thinking that all of a sudden things were going to be fine? And then the second thing that I also did not take into consideration was the whole, you know, uh, pandemic situation with uh, the inability to go to class and meet your classmates, the inability to have activities and like meet people in real life. Those things have slowed down my process. So the first few months when I arrived here, I think like within two to three months, I kind of realized that, <laughs> my girl, you're going to be in trouble. And, um, and that six months was not going to be enough. And I started having all those anxieties and, uh, and worries and started wondering, okay, you need to speed up the process. You need to study more. You need to, um, you know, give it your all. And sometimes I will feel like I wasn't smart enough, that I wasn't getting stuff. So I put a lot of pressure on myself because of that arbitrary deadline of six months that I had in mind. And luckily for me, when I moved to Korea, I realized that I also had some income coming in and that I was going to be able to stay here as long as I wanted, uh, aka two years, because when you have a student visa, you can study Korean for up to two years. So I realized that, hey, why am I pressuring myself when I have two years? As long as you have the money to pay for the program, and as long as you continue to register every single semester, you're fine. So that's when I kind of like 
remove all the pressure off of myself and said, you know what, we're going to take it slow. Um, it's not going to happen overnight and um, let's not stress out the process and just enjoy it. So what's in it for you, you might be asking. My thing is this, if you are working on a budget to come to Korea and study Korean and you're wondering how long is it going to take me, I obviously don't know your skills, I don't know your level, I don't know your background as far as like Korean learning, but all I have to say is give yourself enough room for, um, I won't say mistake, but like so that you don't feel the anxiety so much. And I would say a year would be a safe bet because a year is four trimesters at Sogang. And I think that's going to be at least the minimum that you can give yourself. So as you're working on your budget, think about that, give yourself more room because otherwise those six months or less that you're giving yourself to figure everything out once you get here is not going to be, you know, it's not going to be good for your mental health and it's not going to be good for your overall experience in the country. All right, let's move on to expectations slash assumption number two. Bilingual friends slash significant others are the best learning partners. I personally did not find that to be true for a very long time until I kind of like changed my mindset about it a month ago. So let me just briefly walk you through my process, right? So I assumed that with someone who knows English and Korean, things were going to be very easy. I would be able to, um, you know, speak Korean with the person. If I make a mistake, that person will correct me. If I don't know a word, that person will help me. And that was basically having a walking dictionary or teacher with me, I, I, you know, at all time. And I'm, I'm not saying that because I, that's how I treat my friends. I, I don't treat my friends like that. But you, you know what I'm trying to say here. However, I realized that I was speaking English 80% of the time and not to their fault. It was mine, completely my fault, completely 100% my fault. So you might wonder, okay, so you have this Korean person in front of you who speaks both languages. Why aren't you speaking Korean with them? And it's actually very, very simple to explain. Number one, when you talk, you want to say things fast. You want to get things done. And sometimes having to think in Korean and say it in Korean is a bit tedious. So you might think, okay, you know what? I'm just going to quickly say this thing in English and then the next thing I'll say it in Korean. That's how, you, 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 that's how it starts. Or you would say, hmm, well, I want to have a deep conversation with this person. I kind of want to say stuff that are a bit deeper and my Korean is not good enough. So let me just quickly say that in English and then I'll switch back to Korean. And that, that's how it starts in your mind. It creeps like this a little bit and then next thing you know, you end up speaking English the entire time. Unless you have in front of you someone who clearly tells you, and I have a friend like this, who clearly tells you, I am not speaking English to you, you are not speaking English to me. <laughs> so unless you have that person in front of you, you would revert to English or to whatever language it is that you speak. And that's what I found. And the second thing also is you just don't want to bother. I just did not want to bother people because here's the thing. When you're struggling, and I don't know about you, but me, when I speak Korean, I think a lot before I say anything. Now these days, because you know, I'm kind of getting used to it. It's been 11 months now. So uh, those past few months have been very good to me in that sense. Uh, but I think a lot before I say something. And sometimes the person is just like looking at you, like trying to make your sentences and stuff. And then you're maybe not the person, but you're thinking, oh my God, this person must be so mad at me right now. Or this person must be thinking, oh, can you just, can you just say what you need to say? And I just so don't want to bother that it bothers me that I make the person wait. And as a result, I just say it in English, right? And, but, but again, the person doesn't make me feel that way, but it's just that me in my head, I'm assuming that that's how the person feels and I, I don't want to bother them and I don't want to do this and that. So anyway, so when you have all those thoughts going on in your head, sometimes those friends or those significant others or, you know, it, it's not really helpful because you know they know English. Therefore, it is your duty and your responsibility to force yourself not to speak English. It's not theirs at the end of the day. I mean, you do whatever you want, right? 
Um, so yeah, kind of be, be, be careful of that. You're going to feel that way. And if you do try to like talk yourself out of it because it is not going to be helpful. Now, I do have had situations where I, well, we're not going to talk about my dating life here, are we? Anyway, so when, when, when you have friends that do not speak English at all, I actually find that to be very helpful because then it forces you to say it in Korean and they don't have a choice but to sit there and listen to you because they don't speak English, so they feel bad already. Therefore, because they feel bad of not being able to understand your English, they're not going to give you that same pressure with your Korean. If anything, they're grateful you actually know Korean and you're able to talk to them in Korean. So I, I do have some very good friends. I have like one particular very good friend, um, girlfriend of mine who, who doesn't speak English and who doesn't really care for English. And whenever I meet with her, I remember at first it was such a struggle because I felt so bad. I'm like, I want to know those things about you, but I just don't know how to ask. And if I know how to ask, when you respond, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to understand your responses. But now it's been eight months, I mean, 11 months now. So yeah, we're, we're, we're getting along just fine. But don't dismiss that. It's actually very helpful also when you have someone who doesn't speak English. Uh, granted, you're not going to have those in-depth conversation at first. And granted, it's going to be a bit frustrating for you and maybe for them as well. But I find that I progress faster in those settings than in a setting where the person speaks English. Because, God, I would speak English maybe 60 to 70% of the time. And I'm trying my best not to do that anymore. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a struggle. So keep that in mind. Once you get here, you are going to make friends that's fine. They speak English, they don't speak English. We, we don't want to pick our friends based on, you know, the fact that they're going to teach us Korean or that they're going to help us with Korean because you don't want your friend to feel like you're using them. Just like we don't want to feel like they're using us for English. You don't want to use people to practice your Korean either. Like have genuine relationships with them. And as, as those genuine relationship progresses, you would feel in your heart to be able to talk to them and share things with them and that's going to encourage you to actually speed up your learning process because hell you want to you want to strengthen those relationships so it's like an added motivation so yeah that's my thing the realization that i had and the things that i'm working on is if i have an english speaking person who speaks korean try my best not to speak english with them okay so i call the last and the third one the march struggle because this thing hit me like tons of bricks and that is plateauing when you learn a language and if you don't know what that term means it's when you at first when you learn a language things are going super fast you're learning the basic and you feel very good about yourself because the learning process is fun it's fast and you see progress right away like my level two, my level three, like I could tell I was getting better and you have all this excitement, right? And then you get to a point where you plateau and that's when you start losing motivation. That's when you don't see progress anymore. That's when things get difficult because the funny thing is the more you learn, the more difficult it gets. The grammar gets more difficult. The vocabulary get more advanced. Everything that's being required of you is now a bit, you know, at a higher level. And so when you have those higher expectations and things becoming more difficult and you are plateauing, you're going to start feeling that like you're not doing enough, that you're not good enough, that you're not progressing fast enough. But that's just the way things are. It's, it's the way things go. Like the plateau is something that you cannot avoid. That's something that's you. You have to power through this. And I had no idea what it was. So when it happened to me, I just started beating myself up. And in March, especially like February, March, that's when, oh my God, I was so miserable. I was in my room studying all the time. I just didn't want to go out. I just thought that I had to study all the time to keep up with everything. And then with work and then with like all those different things happening, I just was miserable. And... I started doing some research and then I started talking with my family and 
I started remembering the whole purpose of it all. Like I genuinely love this language. Like I moved to Korea because of Korean. I got into Korea because of the language. Like the language is my love. And to feel that way about it and start hating it was just so hard for me to, to accept and comprehend until I started reading about like plateauing and how this is the process. This is how it's supposed to work. So what I did is I started switching my learning process. The way you study at level two and at level three is not how you're supposed to study at level four. That's something I realized also. Um, you know, what gets you there is not what's going to take you over there, right? So anyway, um, so that's going to happen to you. Most likely you are going to get here. You're going to start learning Korean and feel all excited about like all those new things and stuff. But eventually you're going to feel like you're not progressing enough. You are. You definitely are. So when you meet your friends that you haven't seen in a long time and they give you compliments about your Korean and tell you, oh my God, you've improved. Don't be like me and shrug it off and be like, oh no, what are you talking about? No, if they tell you, it's most likely the truth and accept it. So you're making progress. It's just that the progress is not going to be so blatant, but it's there. And steady wins the race, right? A little bit every day wins the race. That's what I had too pretty much uh, accept. And also I understood that at this point, especially level four, five and up, speaking is important. So instead of being in your room, studying all day your grammar, you should be out there mingling with people. And that's how in April, I kind of like change my lifestyle. I go out now a lot, right? And, and that's because I decided that relationships were more important than studying too hard. I do study. Don't get me wrong. I study because you have to. I mean, those vocabularies, they're not going to get into this brain by themselves, right? I do study. Don't get me wrong. I study a lot, but I also go out a lot, meet with people a lot, have conversations, have relationships, develop those. And having this combo of both is absolutely beneficial. And I've been into that mindset for the past two months and my life has really, really, really improved. And my Korean too. So yeah, you're going to get there. And when you get there, just brace yourself and uh, remember the purpose of it all. Remember why you're doing what you're doing. And uh, also think about like your learning process and maybe try to switch it up a little bit. Um, audit your situation and see what works and what doesn't work. But also uh, the speaking part. Once you get like the basic grammar already, which I think by the end of level three, beginning of level four, you should have those basic grammars that's going to be enough for you to start talking with people. So you have to put yourself in situations where you actually talk to people. All right, that's all for today. I rambled a lot. I'm very sorry. I don't know how I'm going to edit this video or maybe I'll just throw it out there for you to watch. Uh, so hopefully you'll find out to be helpful. If you have questions, you can put them in the comment section or if you want me to uh, dig deeper into a Korean learning related subject, I can also do a video on that one of these days. Um, and if you want to follow me on Instagram, it's at Miss Clay. I share, you know, my daily life in Korea in my stories. And I also share content about like personal development as well. And you can also go on my website called 87withlove.com where I write about personal development. And if you are a young professional interested in moving to Korea and you want to work with me and have me help you uh, get you situated, then you can also go to roadmap to Korea and um, dot com, which is the website where you would sign up for the program. Thank you very much. Uh, take care of yourselves and I will see you in the next video.